I live in coastal South Carolina, where everything is in full bloom right now. So my six-year-old daughter and I were pottering around our raised bed in the yard, churning soil and so on. It was about 10.30 a.m., and we had been in the garden for about 10 minutes when I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. Because we have cottonmouth snakes here, I told my daughter not to move and look closely. We both knelt there with our mouths hanging open. What appeared to be a little man, about three inches tall at most, dark skin, and wearing black, brown clothes, ran across the flower bed. I looked at my daughter and she looked at me. I said, did you see that? She said, yep, that's one of the flower men. I've seen them before, but they run away. I laughed it off and continued weeding. I'm pretty well versed in the flora and fauna of the area, and this definitely was not an insect, mammal, or lizard. I have gone over and over the incident, trying to find a logical identification for what we saw. I have never really had any odd encounters or weird events happen to me before this. It was a really what the hell kind of a moment. So did we suffer a joint hallucination or is my garden home to a pygmy race of flower men? But then if these little guys are good for the garden, they're welcome to stay. Forest Voice I have lived on the same dead end street surrounded by the forest in the quiet rural village of Dorchester, Ontario, for 22 years of my life. One breezy summer night in 2001, when I was 14, I went outside to play basketball. It was around 8 p.m. and the sun had already set. My dad walked past me with our golden retriever. Going down to the road, he said, and left me in the driveway with only the sound of the chain mesh rattling after each basket I scored. I glanced back at the dark road and saw my dad walking out of sight. After a few minutes, I heard three digital beeping sounds coming from the woods across the road. Thinking nothing of it, I shot a few more baskets. Beep, beep, beep. It happened again. I thought it must be someone's cell phone or pager they had dropped in the woods, so I walked to the edge of my driveway to determine the direction of the sound. Then a voice called to me from the forest. Tim, come here for a second, I found something. I thought it was my dad, and assumed he had found whatever had made the beeping noise. What is it? I shouted back. Just come here, hurry up, I found something. Follow my voice. I heard a few more beeps, then, remembering I had seen my dad walk down the road instead of into the woods, I suddenly felt terribly uncomfortable and suspicious. Why don't you come here? I asked. After a long, eerie pause, the voice said, Tim, come here. I found something. I knew my dad didn't have a cell phone and didn't carry a pager while walking the dog. Tim, come into the woods. I've got to show you something. The voice kept coaxing me. I asked why he couldn't just tell me what he'd found, and I kept getting the same responses. At this point, I realized that the voice was only using a certain number of words and phrases, almost as if it were automated and only knew how to speak those particular words. I stepped closer to the forest and peered into the trees, but could see nothing, while the voice kept saying the same things over and over. I began to ignore it and backed away. Finally, the voice stopped, and I heard the digital beeping three more times, then silence. I could see my dad walk up the road and heard the jingle of my dog's collar. He walked right past me. I ran up to him. Well, what did you find? I asked. What? Weren't you calling me, saying you found something? No. He walked into the house. I turned back to face the black forest that was now eerily silent. All I could wonder was, what would have happened to me if I had followed the voice into the forest? Would I have been seen again? For the first time in my life, I was actually terrified. From that point on, I had a disturbing feeling that something supernatural was after me. The Leprechaun One spring or autumn in the late 70s, I visited Glendalough, 
the 5th century monastery in County Wicklow, about 25 miles south of Dublin. The site is vast, with a fine example of a Norman round tower and many other fascinating heaps of old stones. Up on the hill, in the trees overlooking the main site, you can make your way along a narrow track to view St. Kevin's Bed, which turns out to be an extremely uncomfortable looking bony slab of rock, about the length of a man, set into the slope of the hill. My then wife and I went up there on a sunny, cool, windless day. We duly admired St. Kevin's dedication to the ascetic life and continued to amble along the path. There was plenty of sun and plenty of shadows too, as the sun was relatively low in the sky. The path was wide enough for only one person. My wife was walking six or ten feet in front of me, since I tend to dawdle and peer about a lot. From time to time, one passed less frequented tracks leading off this main one. One of these, covered in grass and about six feet wide, went off at right angles on our left, up the hill. On the left-handed edge of this path, perhaps 20 yards away, I saw a leprechaun sitting down in the sun. Oh, there's a leprechaun, I thought, strolling on by, but looking pretty hard at it, as one does on seeing a leprechaun. It was, in its sitting position, about a foot high. If you spend a lot of time in the countryside with a rifle, you learn to judge distances and sizes like this quite accurately. It was entirely green, the green of the grass and ferns and foliage around it. Its clothes and even its skin were green. It did not look like the fat, nasty, garden gnome-like objects the Irish tat shops try to palm off as semblances of the little people. It was slim and wore some kind of trouser. I couldn't see or don't remember its footwear and a sort of smock and a longish droopy nightcap-like item of headgear. Altogether typical of our idea of certain kinds of fairy folk, in fact, although the green skin was a bit of a surprise. I'd gone two or three paces beyond the mouth of the track on which this entity was sitting when it dawned on me that I really should be altogether more surprised than I was. I ground to a halt and said something like, hey wow, I've just seen a leprechaun, and turned back to have another gander. No leprechaun. Not on the track, not on the spot where I thought I'd seen it, not anywhere along it. I took my glasses off to get a low resolution view to see if the now fuzzy sunlight and shadow on the undergrowth would coalesce into some leprechaun-like form. No. Absolutely nothing on the path or at its edges had any anthropomorphic appearance whatever. And there was no wind, remember, to rearrange the leaves and stalks in the time it takes to walk five or six paces. Though there was, when I first started feeling at it, something apparently objective there, or there wasn't. Whatever it was, or was not, it looked just like a leprechaun. So I can truthfully say I have seen a leprechaun. More accurately, I should say I've witnessed the leprechaun phenomenon, which is probably as near to its ontology as one can get. Wardrobe Dwarves one night in 1983, after a week away on a work-related seminar, I returned home to an empty house. My children were staying elsewhere while I was away, at about 9.30 in the evening. I had slept through my flight and the drive home, so was well rested. After turning on the lights, making a cup of tea, and turning on the TV, I decided to unpack my suitcase. I went into my bedroom, slid back the sliding door to the built-in wardrobe, and commenced hanging up some clothes. Within seconds, I was overcome by sleepiness to the point where I staggered backward and lay full length on the bed, shoes and all. I told myself I would just lie down for a few minutes before continuing my plans for the night. The last thing I remember was seeing the ceiling light, which looked incredibly bright. The next thing I was aware of was the sound of several voices, all urging each other to hurry, hurry. I don't know if they were really speaking English or even if they were speaking aloud, this is just the way it seemed. It took a lot of effort to raise my head and look down to the foot of the bed where the voices were. There were several small people tugging on my legs. They were trying to pull me from the bed and into the open wardrobe. It didn't seem odd to me. I wasn't afraid. I looked at them briefly and told myself I was too big and heavy for them to move far. I decided it was safe for me to close my eyes for a few more minutes. 
Then I looked up, and the small people were standing around me, looking at me silently. They were about two or two and a half feet tall. There were males and females. They looked like gnomes or dwarfs. They were stocky. Their skin was very coarse and weathered, as if they spent a lot of time outdoors. They looked at me the way you stare, unmoving and silent when a child starts waking up. On those occasions, you say nothing in the hope the child will drift off to sleep again. Well, that's the way they stared at me. They were not kindly, nor were they overly hostile. They seemed to regard me as a nothing. They had absolutely no compassion or sympathy for me. They did not seem overly intelligent, but they were determined. They were joyless. They wanted me to just go to sleep again, or whatever state it was that kept overwhelming me. At that point, I must have become unconscious again. The odd part is, at that point, when they were gathered around me, I was reversed in position on the bed. My head was where my feet had been moments earlier. Some time later, I again heard their argumentative voices urging each other to hurry. As before, it took a lot of effort to raise my head and open my eyes. When I did, I experienced a huge shock of adrenaline because I could see that they managed to drag me a lot further from the bed. My legs were almost totally off the bed at this point. I grasped instantly that I had awoken just in time. A little bit more and gravity would have done the rest of their work for them and they would have only needed to steer my falling body into the open wardrobe. Again, the scenario did not seem strange to me, which is ridiculous. Nor was I afraid of the little people, which again is illogical. It flashed through my mind that it was my own fault for allowing myself to lie back down. I began kicking out at the little people and screaming at them. I still wasn't afraid of them at that point. I was angry with them. They muttered and groaned amongst themselves. They realized I was not going to lie back down this time. I jumped from the bed and into the middle of the room, which wasn't very large. The light in the room seemed incredibly bright. That's something I've always remembered. From the middle of the room, I continued to yell at the dwarves, or whatever they were. They gave me resentful looks, and then began walking into the open side of the built-in wardrobe. It still didn't seem strange that they existed. They seemed to walk in and down and incline inside the wardrobe. When they were gone, I remained in the center of the room in the bright light for a few seconds. Up to that point, I was not afraid, nor was I in a state of mind to question what had just occurred. Then, I suspect my mind began to return to normal. I ran from the bedroom and into the living room. It was at this juncture that I fell apart in every way. It was very sudden. I was just overcome with terror, shock, panic, hysteria. It was very acute. I couldn't breathe or think. I was close to being out of my mind with fear but it had no real focus. It was just a hideous terror. I was reduced to the level of a very small, terrified child in the space of a few seconds. I phoned a friend who had traveled back with me from the seminar. I couldn't get my breath or speak properly and don't know what I said, but he said he would come straight over. The house was unbearable. I couldn't stand to be in there. All I wanted was to be with others, even strangers. I ran out into the street. All the houses were dark, although there were a few cracks of light showing between some of the curtains. I tried to call out, but my voice wouldn't work. All I could do was make noises and sob. I stayed there on the road until my friend drove up. He looked terrified when he walked towards me. I couldn't talk. He pushed me into the car and said he'd lock up my house for me. We drove to his place. I didn't speak all the way. He put me in a spare room and covered me with lots of blankets. I was freezing and couldn't get warm, nor could I bear to be alone or in the dark. In the end, he spent the night in a chair next to my bed with the lights on. The next day when I got up, I felt weak and dazed, very fragile, very unsure. My friend, a very logical, practical, and skeptical person, didn't want to discuss my experience. I wanted to tell someone what had happened, though, so I told him some brief details. I asked if he thought I'd gone crazy. He said he knew I wasn't, but didn't want to even speculate on what might or might not have occurred, other than to say he'd never seen anyone as scared as I'd been when he found me. We never discussed it again, although we continued to work together for a further 14 years. He was in the perfect position to know I had been perfectly normal only an hour before I'd called him in hysterics, because he had traveled with me on the plane 
and the drive from the airport. He knew I don't drink or take drugs and had been perfectly normal during the week-long seminar. We worked out that whatever had occurred after I arrived home had taken place within three quarters of an hour or less. I never told anyone about my experience with the little people. I was too embarrassed and it sounded too ridiculous. 10 years later, my daughter, then age 20, revealed that she had seen the dwarves or gnomes when she was small and had been terrified of them. She told me they came out of the wardrobe, the same one they tried to pull me into. I asked why she never told me about this. She said she'd known even as a small child that I wouldn't believe her and would have told her it was all her imagination or a dream. She was right. That's exactly what I would have said. If someone else reported an experience like this, I'd probably put it down to a lucid dream. That's the problem. These things happen, but when we hear about them, we seldom believe that they're true. But for the experiencer, it's a different matter. We can't convince others, nor do most of us care to try. I've since reached the conclusion that this is the reason these creatures, whatever they are, sometimes take the form of dwarves or gnomes, because no one believes in the existence of such things. Either that, or my mind saw them as dwarves, rather than acknowledge what they really were, whatever that may have been. Another wardrobe fairy encounter. Abercairn Road, Streatham, 1964. I was five years old and shared the back bedroom with my grandfather. My bed was against the window wall from where I could see the dust sky behind the closed curtains. The light was on as grandfather settled into his bed in the middle of the room. In the distance, against the otherwise clear, darkening sky, I could see a number of small, fluffy clouds, one after the other, and getting lower in the sky as they headed towards my bedroom window. Astride each cloud, riding it like a horse, were small men, one on each cloud, with full dark beards, round metal conical hats that ended in a point. In one hand they carried a trident, not something I had ever heard or seen of before, and in the other hand, a small round circular shield. They drifted right down to the window where they bumped their clouds against the pane as if they were trying to get in the room. Of course, though I don't remember being particularly frightened, I was somewhat perturbed, so asked my grandfather if I could get in bed with him, which I did. And on the side away from the window, but next to a narrow, single wardrobe that stood against the far wall from the window. The light was still on, and I hadn't been asleep. I cannot remember if I told Granddad what I had seen, Doubtless, he would have dismissed it as adults are prone to do. The next thing, without seeing how it happened, the floor carpet was warped around the wardrobe with about seven or eight inches of the carpet being higher than the top of the wardrobe, so it formed a rampart, over which these small men were now standing guard on top of the wardrobe and spaced all around the top and looking over this rampart, like soldiers standing around at the top of a castle wall. I guess these men were about 14 inches tall. Then the wardrobe door opened on its own to reveal inside a classic image of a fairy girl about three foot tall with long black hair and dressed in a white dress that glowed brilliant white as if it were made out of light and she had the classic magic wand. She looked directly at me with a look how to describe it like a doctor might look at a terminally ill child without giving away his feelings, sort of intelligent and wise, knowing something deeply sad about the child on which the gaze rests. She did not say anything, just looked with that benevolent, concerned expression, then the door closed and she was gone. I also noticed in the far left-hand corner, I've always remembered it as clearly and vividly as any important event. My mother used to take me up to bed in the early evening so that my stepfather didn't have to see me. Consequently, it was still light outside. For a further two weeks after this event, I could still see the cobweb of energy floating in the corner, and my mother can still remember me asking her, what's that, as I pointed up to the object that she, of course, couldn't see. Thank you for listening to this video. 
I hope you liked it. If you want more of these videos, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to me. If you have your own scary story to share, please leave it in the comments or go to my Reddit page, r slash I have a spooky story. Maybe your story will be in the next video. Good night, sleep tight, and don't let the shadows